Hey guys, welcome to episode 15 of the Comic Book Showcase. Jamie Hari coming back at you as always. Uh, with me today, Mike, Kyle, and Rab. Uh, we're gonna today we're gonna talk about uh, sidekicks and all the whole wonderful history of sidekicks and all the things they do that make us hate them and love them too much. Uh, since the dawn of capes, there have been sidekicks. Sometimes uh, they're helpful and smart and, and competent, and other times they're basically just a hapless agent of the writer to push the, the plot forward or to uh, get into trouble just so that the superhero has something to do that day. Um, they, the, the sidekicks can be a member of the family, they can be a friend, uh, or even another costume hero sometimes. So uh, today we're all about sidekicks. Um, I'm going to start just by talking about Winter Soldier, who is obviously a great example in recent uh, memory of a character that has historically been uh, you know, second-class citizen and has come into their own, uh, not only in the comics, which is obviously important, but in the movies as well, perhaps, uh, you know... Captain America, the uh, number two, the Winter Soldier, obviously got his name right in the title. Uh, that was pretty handy. Uh, but um, got his own series in 2012 uh, in the comics. I think it was like a 19 or 20 uh, issue run, and it hasn't looked back in terms of popularity. Um, so, guys, what do we think about uh, the popularity of sidekicks? Uh, sometimes overshadowing their their tag along hero. Um, any other good examples, or what do you think? What do you think of Winter Soldier? It was really good that they brought him back because Bucky, I think, was one of the long-forgotten sidekicks, and he was one of the most memorable sidekicks that have been out there. Um, he is pretty much the Robin for the Mar Marvel side of comics, um, and they brought him back in a really good way. It wasn't just like, here's Bucky back from the dead. It's, here's Winter Soldier. He's been alive this whole time, and he's been doing assassinations for the Russians this entire time, and now he is pretty much a villain, and we have to deal with this situation, and they just generally evolve him into, uh, spoilers for people who haven't seen the movie, but into a, a good guy again, and uh, his reincarnation, and, uh, you know, and then bringing him back into his own character again. Like, in the new storylines, he's pretty much uh, independent from Cap again and just doing his own thing. What do you guys think on the DC side of their sort of corollaries, examples, uh ones that are more popular now than ever before? I think you get, you get examples where, like like Mike said, they sort of they ditch the guy that they were with before. Like, say, Nightwing was once Robin and then threw away his cape and stuff and was like, I'm Nightwing now. I'm going to wear this disturbing, golden, weird neck thing. And, and then he becomes... He became his own thing. He got this really long series. He's still going. He's Grayson now. That's pretty cool. Um, and it also makes me think of Wally West because, for example, when Barry Allen died in the 80s, Wally took over the Flash title and then continued on, and he sort of became my generation's Flash. Like... Mm -hmm. Jeff Johns, I know, is a big fan of Barry Allen. That's why he brought him back. But for me, I grew up with Wally West as my Flash, and that's who I wish was still wearing the costume. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Like, I mean, uh, sometimes sidekicks actually do become a hero in their own right. Other times they were a hero in their own right almost from the beginning. Like, I would argue that... Um, you know, you have kind of two classes of sidekick. You have your your Jimmy Olsons and your your um, Dick Graysons, and and pretty much from the beginning, um, Robin was always formidable, both physically and intellectually. Maybe maybe matured over time, sure, and became more of a detective than just a, uh, you know a student uh, of the of the school, but uh, of of you know Batman. But um, I would say that. Jimmy Olsen was largely always incompetent uh, during the beginning, and he was just a, a bit of a fodder for the writers to either give uh, Superman someone to chide or to, you know, rescue or to, you know, mentor. But, uh, you know, I think there's those kind of different classes, and uh, sidekicks that become a hero in their own right, I, I would believe are the more interesting ones, the ones that have uh, better fleshed out uh, histories, they have uh, adventures of their own, perhaps books of their own, titles of their own. Um, those are the ones I like to see, and it's, it's always interesting that the universes sort of mature over time and, 
and the characters grow up and they move out and night, they become Nightwing and, and that type of thing. So it's interesting. Kyle, do you have any thoughts on on that? Well, I, I wanted to talk about the uh, the ethics and uh, uh, the dilemmas of of a adult or adult hero having a sidekick. Kind of the the two schools of thought that go into that. Like on the one hand, you have a, a hero who realizes that they they can't survive forever. They won't, you know, they won't be fighting crime most likely in their 80s unless they're the Justice Society. So you know, it's nice to have someone kind of uh, trained to take their place when the day comes when they can no longer fight crime. And you know, it's kind of a nice you know thing for a hero to have to come back to the lair and you know kind of unwind and discuss crime fighting, you know, with the sidekick. But on the other hand, you have an adult who's out there fighting people with guns and killer gorillas and laser beams, and you're taking an eight-year-old in with a costume into battle. And uh, I think a lot of people would kind of frown on that if that was a real-world thing. Like, you know, if we took eight-year-olds into, you know, a war, people would kind of frown on that. Well, I think a really good example of that is uh, Hit Girl. I mean, you here you have a young child um, whose father is training her to kill and shoot and just destroy and be a vigilante like way above the par that Batman is training Robin to. Uh, Batman never intends to have his victims be killed, but in Hit Girl's situation, it's perfectly acceptable. I mean, there is a lot of violence in um, those comic books, and like she mangles the shit out of some people, and even in the movies. I mean, she was decimating people, and it, like... It takes its toll. I mean, he, he pretty much has taken her childhood away from her for his own personal goal. Um, he thought he was bettering her because that's the way his view was, but it was a selfish view because he essentially took a child and made her into an adult well before her time. Yeah, because, well, hit, not Hit Girl, but uh, Kick-Ass is it's a satire. It's also a straight-up story, but it's a satire to a, to an extent, and it shows us that Hit Girl is way too young to be doing this and that her dad is actually kind of insane. Uh, but you have to remember that Batman is also kind of insane. So Batman taking on Robin is... It's not that different, but... No, I, and the I thing wanna... that... He does it, like, consistently, too. He's like, oh, I lost one. I gotta get me another one of those. <laughs> well... I want to bring up the point that uh, one of the reasons that Robin was created was because Batman was kind of boring with no one to talk to. So they bring him this character who he can talk to. And I don't know why they make it like a... Well, they make it a kid so that it will... So that kids, like actual kids, can identify with one of the characters, right? So you've got this old man. A kid's not going to want to be like... I. The kid wants to be the old man, but they can't, like, they they want to also be, they want to be the kid who can hang out with Batman, basically. So that's why they get this kid. Robin, period, sentence over. Okay. <laughs> but when when you go back to those comics from the Golden Age, the kid is, like, saying really dumb stuff or just repeating obvious obvious things you can see in the panel, like, holy moly, Batman, here's some guacamole. And um, <laughs> you, you can't... The, as, as you said, as the comics have matured over time, so have the, how, so is the dialogue for these kids. And so at, when they're supposed to be 10 years old, you have to sort of suspend your disbelief about them being 10 years old because as you're reading, they talk like a 15-year-old or older, and you're thinking, well, this kid isn't necessarily... Like, you have to... It's not real. They're not actually 10 years old. They're not actually 8 years old. So it's it's an unbelievable situation, so we can't necessarily condemn superheroes for taking on kid sidekicks because it's a totally... It's a fantasy. Yeah, so Kyle, you know, like, the, the, actually... Go ahead. I was going to talk about Damian Wayne. He was a real step away from the traditional sidekick. And, I mean, yes, he, he just passed away. But um, I think, really, when you look back on it, he was probably one of the best modern-age sidekicks that we've had because he wasn't really... I mean, Bruce took him in only because he was afraid of what Damian would do if he wasn't under his wing because Damian was a trained 
assassin. He was a sociopath. Like, he was crazy. And, I mean, it, there was times when it showed in the comic books him, you know, crossing that boundary just a little bit where other Robins never, ever went. And he really got chastised by Bruce for those, like, little missteps and everything like that. And uh, I really enjoyed that they brought him in. I wouldn't say he was my favorite Robin ever, but I liked the way that they handled it. The fact that he was this twist on um, how Batman wants to be, how Batman should be. So so on that point, you mentioned that Damian Wayne is, or was, a, a great example of a modern uh, sidekick. So, uh, Kyle, I'm going to toss this over to you. What do you think, like, obviously sidekicks have changed a lot since the days of uh, Superman's pal, Jimmy. Um, how Do you think it's a reflection of society in terms of the way we um, envision what a sidekick should be or, or what are good, uh, sensible characters? Or do you think it's it's largely um, more to just do with the writer style? Or, or what do you what do you think why we've, we've seen such a, a dramatic change in, in sidekick? Dumb. I think part of it is just uh, as, as readers, we become more mature with our expectations. Like you don't expect to see Superman be, you know, chastising, you know, his sidekick. You don't expect to see, you know, the the sidekick just say, "Hey, look, there's a bad guy," and then get tied up, and the whole story revolves around the superhero, you know, having to rescue them. You expect if if a superhero has a sidekick that they have at least trained them to the the degree that, you know, they're not going to get, you you know, bushwhacked and, you know, the whole story revolves around, you know, their rescue. We want to read the story where maybe they're not as, you know, as trained and as efficient at crime fighting as the hero, but we want them to be at least, you know, able to kind of hold their own as, you know, both a crime fighter and as a character. And I don't think that people today, with, you know, the exception of some comic relief now and then, people don't want to see a sidekick that is just kind of bumbling and not really contributing to the story or, or the crime fighting. So not, not on the point of uh, bumbling or cowardly or anything like that, but what about non-super, non-superhero sidekicks? Like I'm thinking of Lois Lane, for example. She's, you know, able to hold her own and obviously in some cases has had... Uh, superpowers, but um, by and large, she's just a human with only her wits about her, and uh, able to sort of provide value in a situation. Um, like, what do we think about characters like that? Like, I mean, I guess that kind of breaks your point about um, you know us wanting always to have a character that's trained to a certain degree, or um, you know, under the the wing and um, care of the the primary. Like, Superman's not out there teaching her how to you know karate chop. Think, I don't think Lois Lane is a sidekick. I think she's a supporting cast member. Rob, what do you think of that? Do I think she's a supporting cast member? Uh, yes. Or as opposed to a sidekick. As opposed to a sidekick. Well, I think even Jimmy isn't a sidekick anymore. Like, Jimmy sure. and, and Lois to an extent, like especially during the Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane, and mm-hmm. Jimmy's, Superman's wow. pal, Jimmy Olsen, they're... They're products of the Silver Age when things needed to be lighter for some reason. I don't. It was just like the more sidekicks you have, the better. So you've got Jimmy, you've got Crypto, you've got Supergirl, you've got Laurie Lamaris, you've got Lo- Lois and Lana and all of the other people whose names start with L. And now, though, they've they've kind of just become supporting cast and. They still, I think Lois, especially during the period where she and Clark were married, she wasn't so much a sidekick as sort of his, well, she was his wife, obviously. But one of the things about her is that she always, even though she was frequently getting into trouble and needing to be saved, she would always say, I don't care that I don't have superpowers. I don't care if it's dangerous. I'm a reporter. I'm going to do this. And that's a very uh, admirable quality, I guess, in Lois as because she puts herself in danger regardless of concerns about her safety. And I think any sidekick who does that is pretty cool, but especially, especially a no-power sidekick, even though Lois isn't really technically a sidekick. Anyone who is willing to 
who is doing it for themselves is somehow a cooler character, I think. Um, I'm actually going to toss this out to everyone who's watching this. Uh, what is your definition of a sidekick? Um, where do you draw the line? Is it supporting cast, uh, sidekick, uh, sidekick as we talked about with Lois and, and Jimmy versus, say, uh, a Robin? Uh, and, and second question, uh, who's the best uh, sidekick that ever lived? Like, who is the most ideal, whether it was uh, in the way that they kicked butt and took names or whether it was just being uh, the pal, the exact antithesis of their caped uh, buddy that they were following around. So answer those two questions. Let us know in the comments. Tell us why we're wrong. And uh, that's kind of the end of the show for this week. So that's about all about sidekicks. Join us in the extra scenes if you want to hear us talk endlessly about other things like Chewbacca and Watson and Gabrielle and Xena. So anyway, uh, thanks for joining us. And that's a wrap for another episode of the Comic Book Showcase. Join us again live via chat or Twitter next week. Like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. And to learn more about today's topics, check out the Marvel and DC databases on Wikia, the ultimate resources for comic book information anywhere.